Our reading tonight is from the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning at verse 16. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have been thinking a lot about kings. Some of you already know this. I have been watching a lot of movies and television shows for months now about the British monarchy. It started in December with Elizabeth R., a 1971 miniseries. What followed were the movies Elizabeth, Elizabeth the Golden Age, Mary, Queen of Scots, Anne of the Thousand Days, all four seasons of The Tudors. After that, we went back to Henry II with Beckett and The Lion in Winter. Fast forward several hundred years to Edward and Mrs. Simpson, and then rewind again to the miniseries The Six Wives of Henry VIII. And back to his daughter with The Virgin Queen. It still isn't over. I have a list of 15 movies I have not yet seen, all about Elizabeth alone. We, which is to say the movie and TV watching public, seem to have a bottomless appetite for the stories of kings and queens. And it was not unheard of for monarchs to be executed. Lots of beheadings. Mary, Queen of Scots, James I, Lady Jane Grey, the queen for several days, Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard, not to mention courtiers such as Sir Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell. It is a fearful thing to watch a monarch walk to the place of execution. Even if you are aware that you're watching actors, even if you are aware they are on a very accurate period set and that it's all being recorded for purposes of entertainment, your pulse quickens a little. Your throat dries out. Anne Boleyn was convicted of adultery and high treason, though most scholars believe she was innocent of all crimes, and really the victim of the king's fierce desire to have a male heir. On the day of her execution, she walked to the scaffold smiling, knowing that her pain would soon be over, that her suffering would be ended. In a gray gown trimmed with fur, an ermine cape over her shoulders, her long hair tucked up into a white bonnet to give the executioner, a particularly skilled swordsman brought in from France, a good view of her neck. She spoke to the crowd. She said, good Christian people, I am come hither to die. For according to the law and by the law, I am judged to die and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, but I pray God save the king and send him long reign over you, for a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never. And to me he was ever a good, a gentle, and sovereign lord. And thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you to pray for me. O oh Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul. 
The Gospel of John is so very different from the other three Gospels. Are you getting tired of me saying that? I have to keep saying it. I can't help myself. Read John's account of the crucifixion and then read any of the other three. In John's Gospel, Jesus goes to the cross with all deliberateness, with all calm, with all confidence that this is God's will and God's plan and that it is, instead of a moment of despair or defeat, a moment of absolute resplendent glory. In our short passage today, Pontius Pilate pronounces the sentence, though we don't ever hear his words. There is only one ruler, only one king here. John wants us to know that. It is not Pilate, it is Jesus. He is not assisted by anyone. He carries the cross himself. He is not led. He is not dragged. He is not carried. He leans on no one. He walks under his own power. He is crucified alongside two other men, but their backstory and their ultimate fate is no concern to John. So we don't hear a word from them or about them. Our focus is on Jesus and only Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This caused some amount of consternation. Why not write this man said I am the King of the Jews, they asked. What I have written? I have written, the prefect replied. What are we to make of this? Do we nod our heads and think, oh, Pilate is convinced? Or do we look at the prefect of Judea and think, he's figured out another way to torment the Jewish population, show them a man on a cross, and send them a message, no one is safe, not even your king. I think we could go either way. Me, I lean toward out of the mouths of, well, not babes, but in this case, out of the mouth of the enemy, out of the mouth of the oppressor. The person you would least expect to get it, gets it. The people with all the education, the ones who know their scripture inside and out, the ones who spent their lives steeped in God's word, they don't get it, not here, not now. But really, why should they get it? Even now, 2,000 years after the fact, with something like 99 generations of preachers between Jesus and us, 99 generations of people interpreting the story for us, explaining it to us, helping us to see Jesus for who he is, we read these words, or we close our eyes, or we gaze up at a movie screen or a television to watch a biblical epic, and we see an image of a man nailed to a cross, and it is very, very hard, very hard to understand what on earth Jesus means by his hour of glory. Irenaeus was a prominent figure in the early church born just about 100 years after the death of Jesus on the cross. At the very heart of his faith was a conviction that the unseen, unknowable God, who had created everything, so loved humanity that he had become a human being just like us. And perhaps the statement of Irenaeus that is the best known and most often quoted is one that speaks to this text. The glory of God is the person fully alive. And the life of the person is the vision of God. John tells us that this vision of Jesus on the cross is the hour of his glory. It is the glory of God. The moment in which he is lifted high on the cross is the moment at which Jesus is the most fully alive because it is the moment for which he was born. 
It is the moment at which he truly gives us a vision of God, a vision of kingship, unlike any we have seen before and unlike any we are likely to see again. We see the God and King who does not leave us alone in suffering, but who joins us there. We see the God and King who does not cling to his power, but who empties himself of it. We see the God and King who does not flinch from love, but who embraces it, arms stretched wide, whatever the cost. Thanks be to God. Amen.